Luke 16, starting from verse 19, God's word says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's, Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called out to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tongue of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in this lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. <coughs> this is God's word. When God's word is read, God speaks. So our question this morning, what happens when I die? What happens when I die? I dare say many of you have seen the classic film, Jaws, it was a, a huge film made in 1975, so it's quite ancient now, uh, directed by Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. As, as you know, it's about a great white shark who decides to make a small beach resort his, of Amity his own private feeding grounds. And this frustrates the, the, the chief of police who wants to close the beach so that the shark will have no food and the shark will leave and the people will be safe. But he's thwarted by the town's mayor who's afraid that this bad publicity might spoil the tourist industry for the town. And so he refuses. They decide not to say anything, resulting in more and more deaths as the monster gets hungry. The mayor knew the truth, but chose to say nothing. He was afraid that giving out bad news might upset some people and so he kept quiet and the good people of amity and the visitors many lost their lives because he was afraid to tell the people what they needed to know to save them from certain disaster so i want to ask you this morning do you know some good news that the people need to hear but do you also need to warn the people of some bad news that the people need to hear. I want to look at our subject this morning under two headings. What happens when non-Christians die and what happens to Christians when they die? So what happens to non-Christians when they die? The Bible has much to say about this. Jesus spoke about two particular things more than anything else. The first, do you know what it was? Money. Jesus spoke about money more than anything else and our, our attitudes and uses of it. And he spoke about hell more than anything else. More than 25 times Jesus spoke about hell. He clearly spoke about hell. To spoil people's fun? No so that we clearly understand that there is a hell. He had no taboos about speaking about hell, so neither should we. Turning to the passage, in verse 22, we read that the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. 
The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off with Lazarus at his side. So quite clearly, this is not the same Lazarus that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, not the same man whatsoever. Same name, that's okay. And he was, where did he go? Where did the rich man go? Well, your NIV says hell. But if you look beside it, in verse 23, it says in hell, you'll see a tiny little letter C. And if you go down to the bottom of the page, it says that the Greek word actually means Hades. This is a slight confusion by the NIV. The NIV is not as clear as it could be here. The, the rich man went to a place called Hades, where he was in torment. That is not hell. They are not the same place. Hades, or as it's referred to in the Old Testament, Sheol, is a waiting place. Okay? When non-Christians die, they go to Hades or Sheol. It's the same place, different name. And it's a temporary holding place. And the non-Christian will go to Hades, the temporary place, until the day of judgment, which is when the Lord Jesus comes. And then, if they are found wanting, with no faith in the Lord Jesus, then, and only then, will they go to hell. Okay? So, Hades, when they first die, when Jesus comes, the second return, and judges them, then... Those without faith in Jesus will then will be sent to hell. Not until. Okay? The NIV is slightly misleading here. Very clear. In <coughs> the rich man was in Hades, where he was in torment. What was it like? A place of agony. It was a place of agony. Unrelenting agony. And it was a place where there was no second chance it's not a place where you stay for a while and then there's a second chance of going to glory verse 26 abraham says between you between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us so that it's a place of no second chances they're in constant, conscious agony, and it lasts for all of eternity. It will never, never end. They will be in physical pain, but they're also going to be in mental anguish, knowing that they are separated from ever from the living God whom they have rejected. Hell itself will be a place once described as if all the pain, sorrow, misery and calamities which have ever happened to all of mankind should meet together and centre down on one man, that would not amount to one day in hell. If all the calamities that happened to humanity were centred just down on one man, it would not amount to one day in hell, it has been said. Now, we all, we all have friends who say, I want to go to hell because that's where my friends will be. That's where the best party's going to be. How wrong they are. How wrong they are. There will be others there. They, they, many of their friends will be there. But those condemned to hell, it says in Isaiah, and they will go out and look at the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. In other words, there will be plenty company, but there will be no friends. Because everybody will loathe one another. They will not want company with another, one another. They will loathe each other. There are no relationships in hell. Christmas is coming. That means the Steve McQueen film, The Great Escape, will be on television. And what, what was Steve McQueen's punishment for constantly trying to escape? Isolation. Isolation. The Germans knew, but any, any prisoner of war camp knows that Isolation is a dreadful punishment. Hell 
will be in isolation forever and ever. In verse 24, notice that the rich man said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tongue, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Whatever agonies we have experienced in this world, it will be of nothing compared to the agonies of hell. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, They will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus used that expression many times. He meant it. And one of the worst things is that they will be conscious of God and they will hate him forever. God's presence will be known in hell, but the people will hate him forever. Why are they there? Is it unfair that God should send those to eternity, those who didn't know the consequences of their unbelief? Well, let me tell you very clearly, not one person in hell will protest that they are there. They will know why they are there. They will not want to be anywhere else. The, 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 the cartoon picture of, of people struggling and pleading to cry to climb out of hell and God's pushing them down with a big stick saying, Ha ha ha! You've got what you deserve. No. They will be in hell and they will know why they are there. And they will never want to leave and go into God's presence. They have rejected God in this world. They, will, they want to reject God forevermore. We can talk about the heathen in other countries who, who haven't heard about Jesus. But the Bible says, Romans chapter 1 says that all mankind have seen the, 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 the beauties of God's creation so that nobody is without excuse. All human hearts know that there is an almighty God. What has been the best-selling book for year after year after year after year? It's the Bible, isn't it? Now, we know it's not the best-read book, but it's the best-selling book. And in every copy of that book, there are stories of judgment that every child knows. There are stories about Adam and Eve. Judgment was served on them, wasn't it? Stories about Noah's Ark. Tell me a child who's never heard of Noah's Ark. Isn't that about God's judgment? Sodom and Gomorrah? Jonah and the whale? Isn't that about God's judgment? Everybody knows these stories. But they will not respond because they choose not to. All of these stories are known to everybody. They speak of God's judgment over sin. So they will, those in hell will be without excuse. You know that the number one reason why this church isn't packed out to the rafters with the good people of Oakwood is because the people refuse to come. Isn't that true? The people refuse to come. They are rejecting God. And those who have rejected God in this life, God gives them the desires of their heart in rejecting him in the afterlife. C.S. Lewis... You know the author of Language in the Wardrobe? C.S. Lewis said, I believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the end. The doors of hell have been locked <coughs> from the inside, said C.S. Lewis. Locked from the inside. What should our response be? What should our response be? At my last church up north, there was a, an, elderly, an elderly gentleman developed gangrene in his foot. When he went to the doctors, and it was clearly diagnosed that this is gangrene, so what kind of doctor would say, this man is seriously ill? If the gangrene is not treated, it will spread through his body and he will die. But if I tell him, he will be upset. So instead, I'm going to give him some antibiotics, tell him it's just an infection, and you'll be fine. And I'll give him an elastoplast to cover over the sores. 
I mean, he, he wouldn't want me to tell. He wouldn't want me to tell him that he was in great danger, would he? He wouldn't want that. Is there any doctor in the world would say that? No, a proper doctor will, will say, look mate, here's the situation. You've got a deadly disease, but we can treat it. We can do something about it. It will involve bringing you into the theatre. It will take it. It will involve taking very sharp knives and cutting off your foot. But you will thank me for it because you will live. Isn't that what any patient would want to hear if they're seriously ill? Then we have good news that people need to hear. We have good news that people need to hear. And we cannot, we cannot keep it to ourselves. Should we dare, can we dare say, I don't want to tell them in case they get upset? No, our, our attitude should be that of a, a, a caring doctor. Tell them. Because there is good news. Yes, there is bad news, but there is good news. No, to, to, to keep the good news of Jesus Christ to ourselves is the most unloving and uncaring thing we can ever do. It's good news that we, we need to share. So what happens to a Christian when they die? What happens to a Christian when they die? very poignant since only two days I was standing beside the casket of my friend. We all know what it is to stand at a graveside or to go to a funeral service and feel cheated. We feel cheated when we go to a funeral service because somebody that we value has been taken away and something deep inside of us knows that that's not the way it's meant to be. We're not meant to lose our dearly loved friends and family members. It just feels wrong inside. Death was never part of God's plan, was it? In the beginning, there was no death, but death entered this world when the whole of humanity which at the time was only Adam and Eve, the whole of humanity rebelled against God. And humanity has been rebelling against God ever since. Death comes to us all because we live in a fallen world, a world in which sin has ended. But for the Christian, God never uses death as a punishment for sin. No, 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 no. Jesus has taken all of the punishment for our sin. So when our time comes, it is never a punishment for your sin. Get this. Death is what God uses to complete our sanctification. Death is the instrument that God uses us to make us perfectly like Jesus. And that's good news. We want to be more like him day by day. Well, on that day that we die, we will be completely like him. God uses our death as a, the, uh, as a means of the perfect sanctification. Death is the beautiful doorway that we must pass through one day to leave behind the sinfulness forever. God wants us to follow Christ and so we must pass through that doorway of death just as he did. Now for the Christian, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Yes, I, f I fully understand that the process of getting through that doorway may be a difficult in the extreme. It may be through a long, painful illness. It may be suddenly through a road accident or a heart attack. I, I, I do not want to minimise the, the suffering that may be involved in getting to the point of death. But once we reach there, death itself holds no fear for the Christian. The, the Apostle Paul looked on his own death as good news, something he was looking forward to. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That's what he wants. I want to leave this place and go, with, go be with Jesus. Because there's nothing better, says Paul. Nothing better. 
In Philippians 1, 21, he says the same thing. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is better. It is better to be with him. Are these the words of a man who is fearful of his own death? No, it's a man who understands the deepest desire of Paul's heart is to leave this world and go to be with his glorious saviour. He understands that this world is not all there is. He understands that this world is just the porch before the mansion. He understands that. And he wants the mansion where his father indeed has many rooms. In an age where people are even afraid to talk about death, I want you to know that death holds no fear for the Christian. No fear as it, for those who profess faith in Jesus. Remember, we, we, we do not go alone. We do not face death alone. Psalm 23, one of the most well-known psalms by Christians and many non-Christians, Psalm 23 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. <coughs> with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus is waiting for us on the other side of the doorway of death. He's been through that doorway and he knows what it's like. He's waiting for us and he's going to metaphorically take us by the hand and lead us forward. And that is glorious. Of course, it's right and proper to die when a Christian... Is, sorry, it's, it's right and proper to grieve when a, when a Christian dies. Of course, we mourn for them. They leave a huge hole in our lives. But the sadness is not for them. We should never feel sad for a Christian who's died. Feel sad for ourselves, for the hole they've left in our lives. But rejoice that they've gone to be with Jesus. It's glorious. You know, in the Act seven and into chaps, uh, Act seven and into Acts chapter eight, Stephen gives that beautiful history of Israel and says that the culmination of their history is fulfilled in Jesus. And what do the people do? They pick up rocks, they pick up boulders, and they stone him to death. And we read in Acts 8 verse 2, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation for him. In other words, they wept over his death. Christians wept at the death of another Christian. That, that's right and proper. But we don't weep for them. They've got to be with Jesus. We weep for ourselves, for the hole that they've left in our lives. In John chapter 11, Jesus wept over the death of Lazarus. But this sorrow we feel at the death of a Christian is always mingled with hope and joy. I'm sure you've been to a, a, a Christian funeral where there is hope, where there is confidence. It is so unlike the funeral of a non-Christian where there is no hope at all. The funeral of a Christian can be a glorious thing because there's hope through Jesus Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? <clears throat> there is none. There is none. Death is defeated by Jesus. But the real question is, where do I go? Where do you go? You yourself. Where do you go when you die? I'm, I'm interested in the theory. I'm interested in the theology, but I want to know about me. I want to know about my wife. I want to know about my kids who trust in Jesus. What happens to them? Quite simply, death is the separation of our body and soul. Nothing more. Death is the separation of our body and soul. <coughs> our body dies. Our soul lives forever. You understand that, that you are a, an eternal being. Everybody is an eternal being. Every single human being lives for eternity from the moment of their conception. Death is the separation of our body and our soul. Our body turns to dust, the soul, what did Jesus say to the 
to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Our soul goes immediately into the presence of Almighty God. There's no such thing as soul sleep. There's no such thing as purgatory. No, the soul or the spirit, they are the same thing, goes immediately into the presence of God with rejoicing. Your soul will be fully alive with Christ and you'll be at the throne of Almighty God. You will worship him and you'll know you're there. You'll be consciously awake. You'll know that you're in front of Almighty God. You will worship Jesus. You will see him. You will rest from the sin and tears and pain and heartbreak and sickness that are in this present world. You'll rest for them for all of eternity. The, the heavenly city will be a place of eternal joy and beauty. But better than that, better than the city, will be with our Saviour Jesus. We'll be with Jesus. We'll be in the very presence of Almighty God, with enjoying unhindered access to the Lord of glory. One or two of you understand this, I can see by the expression on your face. One or two of you get this, that it will be glorious. The Apostle Paul writes in Revelation 21, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. How glorious. In a million years' time, you'll be standing in front of the throne, amazed, delighted and satisfied in the Lord Jesus. In 10 million years' time, you'll be doing exactly the same thing and you will love it. You will never get old. It will always be glorious for all of eternity. Forever in God's glorious presence. Heaven is the one place where God makes his glorious presence known intimately. When you look into your saviour's eyes and he looks back to you with loving eyes, you'll see the fulfilment of everything we know to be right and good in the universe. Then, with joy, our hearts and voices will, will join the redeemed, and join with, from all the ages, join with the heavenly armies singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power forever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And we join the elders. And we fall, we'll fall down in worship. We'll be among that crowd one day. It's fantastic. The prospect for the Christian is glorious. I need to close with one simple thought. But if you've never come to a personal relationship with this Jesus, the Bible <coughs> teaches you to do it without delay. Do it without delay. If you've not come to Christ yet, come today. Come today. God does not want you to spend eternity away from him. Get this. In Ezekiel 33, God declares... As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? See the heart of the Lord here? That's what he wants. He wants people to turn to him and be saved. Going back to the Bible reading from Luke 16, we saw that the rich man was not condemned for any great act of evil. He was condemned because <coughs> he left God out of his life. Simple as that. <coughs> he left God out of his personal equation. He had all the, he put his faith in all these beautiful luxuries that he had and his luxurious lifestyle and quite simply he left God out of the equation. That's all. That was his greatest sin. The greatest sin anyone can commit is to trample on the spilt blood 
of Jesus Christ and say that it doesn't matter. In verse 27, he begs Abraham to, to send his brothers and warn. Uh, give, 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 he, sends, he begs Lazarus to go to the brothers and give them a warning, but there's nothing Lazarus can do. In verse 29, Abraham explains that the only thing that will save his brothers is to listen to Moses and the prophets. Where would they hear about Moses and the prophets? In this book. This is the place where you hear about Moses and the prophets, isn't it? He's saying, I've given you the Bible. Go read it. Go read it and find the message of salvation. And take notice of what it says. In Acts chapter 16, it says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That was right 2,000 years ago when it happened in the city of Philippi and it's still right today. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That applies to you now if you've never trusted in Jesus. So come if you've never done so and know what it is to be certain of your future in heaven with Jesus because of what he has done on the cross. Trust him and you'll be safe with him forevermore. I urge you, do it today if you've never done so. He's a glorious saviour. And it's going to be so exciting to spend eternity with him, which is what he wants for you.